Good evening, friends of Rust. Uh, welcome to our um, today's meeting, meetup, Rust. Um, first of all, thanks, Stefan, for making this possible. Also, thanks a lot, Mike, for all the effort regarding um, the uh, filming. And today, I have the pleasure to introduce to you um, Ralph Jung who's a professor here at ETH at the, the Department of Informatics. And he's also part of the uh, language... Uh, please, please help me a bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the language team advisors and co-lead of the Rust Operational Semantics team. Thanks. Um, good. <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, coming here, Ralph, and the stage is yours. Yes, thanks a lot for the nice introduction and thanks you all for coming and however many more people are logged in virtually. Um, I'm happy to talk a bit here about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, both kind of in my free time and in my research. I think a lot about unsafe rust and, and the abyss that hides there and the ways we can, well, like the things we can do to make unsafe rust kind of safer. Um, this is meant to be interactive. I'm hoping for tons of questions because otherwise I will not have enough material to fill 45 minutes. So please ask away any time during the talk when I say something that's unclear. I hope, I hope at least some of the things that I say will surprise some people here and, uh, and incur some follow-up questions. Can I close the door? Thanks. Um, all right, so let's, let's start with the usual kind of high-level selling point that we, that we tell other people about Rust which is that Rust is a memory-safe language. So the compiler guarantees that all sorts of bad things do not happen in your program. This you know, program is not going to access memory out of bounds or out of time. Uh, it's not going to execute the wrong code by executing some kind of shell code or whatever nonsense might happen. It's not going to have any data races. A bunch of like, pretty fundamental flaws that plague software all day and that cause security issues and crashes do not happen in Rust. Uh, that's the idea. Except, of course, there's a big asterisk here because there is this thing called unsafe code. And in unsafe code, you can do all sorts of nastiness, like take a pointer to something, do some arithmetic to take it out of bounds, and then do an access. And now we do have an out of bounds access, even though this is Rust. So um, most of the Rust code out there is completely written in safe code. Uh, this talk is not concerned with that. This talk is concerned with the, I don't have data, 1%, I don't know, the small fraction of Rust code that has to use unsafe for various reasons. Unsafe exists for good reasons. We need it to be able to write low-level, high-performance code that's correct for reasons which are too complicated for the compiler to understand, but it's a very sharp knife, and we have to be super careful in how we use it. So let's start a bit by seeing just how sharp this knife is. Once you start writing unsafe Rust, guaranteeing memory safety, guaranteeing all these nice property is your responsibility. And this... Um, the, the like a w nice way to think about this is that you're kind of entering a contract with the compiler where both parties have obligations and kind of rights or privileges. And the key obligation of both sides is that on the one hand, the compiler is obligated to generate a binary that when you run it, does the thing that matches the source code you wrote. But there's also an obligation on your side, which is that you have to follow the rules. You, you, you must not do things like that. You must not perform out of bounds memory accesses or all sorts of other things. And this obligation is not to be taken lightly. If you break that obligation, all sorts of weird stuff can happen. Uh, this might look like a nice magical wonderland and a good drug trip or something, but really it's more like a nightmare drug trip in, in, in all reality. Uh, I just didn't want to endure fear in the audience by taking the appropriate picture. So um, let's Let's get Firefox to open things in the right window, maybe. Um, let's look at one example of the weird things that can happen. So here's a little function, which obviously will always return true. Right? We are testing if some integer is either less than 120, equal to 120, or greater to 120. There's no way this function cannot return true. Uh, at the bottom of this here is a little thing, a little main function, which calls that function. And then if it returns false, states that the bad thing happened. And if you run this on current stable Rust, now I hope the demo gods are with me, um, then the impossible has in fact happened. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that happens, that can happen, when you break your part of the obligation. Do not, ob do not ignore the obligation. Of course, the annoying thing is that in many cases, like if you change this code just a bit, maybe like that, 
then the impossible will not happen anymore. So it's not like you can rely on strange stuff happening. It's just sometimes strange stuff might happen. And it might not happen on Mondays, but it might happen on Tuesdays. So this strange stuff happening, you failing to uphold your obligation as an unsafe code author, that is what we call undefined behavior in Rust. And um, you might have heard a related term, which I want to briefly talk about, even though most of this talk will be about undefined behavior. The related term is soundness. So soundness is a property of a function that you write. Like imagine you are a library create author, you're using some unsafe code internally, but you're a good citizen and you want to expose safe to use functions to the outside world. Something like this call me function, which of course is completely silly to use unsafe for that. This is just for purpose of demonstration. So what does this function do? It takes a shared reference to a Boolean. It does some pointer casting to turn this into a raw pointer to type U8. So we can kind of look at the underlying bits and bytes of the Boolean. We do a load, we check if it's two, which it shouldn't, never, shouldn't ever be because it's a Boolean. And if it is two, we call this hint unreachable unchecked, which is kind of the ultimate form of undefined behavior. If that code ever executes, we have immediate undefined behavior. And so this reaching this line is an immediate violation of your obligation as part of this compiler programmer contract. Uh, and this function is sound, because no matter which kind of safe code you will write, a shared reference to a bool will always be true or false. It will always be one or zero. It will never be two. So even though there is unsafe here, this unsafe is kind of safely hidden behind a typed API that uses the Rust types to express the constraints needed to make this thing safe to call. Right? If you replaced bool by u8, this function would no longer be sound. Of course, uh, if we change this a bit to maybe a raw pointer version of this code, like a star const here, then this might change. So what, what do you think? Is this still sound, or do we now have an unsound library? Unsound. Yes? Yes? Maybe I should, people raise hands. Who thinks this is uh, still sound? One half of a vote. Uh, who thinks it's unsound? A lot more votes. Uh, the majority is right. Um, yes, this is very unsound. Um, like one of the ways we could break it is by creating a reference to two and turning that reference into a raw pointer and passing it to call me. All of those things, creating a reference and then turning it into a raw pointer, are possible from safe code. So this is sufficient to demonstrate that this library is unsound because we've demonstrated a safe client where the bad line has been reached. Um, in fact, the, the bool here is kind of a red herring. Um, even if I remove this, this thing here, that's still unsound because I can just take an arbitrary random integer, cast it to a raw pointer in safe code, and pass it to this function. So this thing is unsound for all sorts of reasons. Um, so the, to summarize the key terminology here, undefined behavior is a property of an entire program, a thing with the main function, something you can run. And the property is, well, undefined behavior means it violates the rules. Where soundness is a property of a library. So th those properties talk about different, they kind of talk about objects of different type. A library is sound in approximation, there's an asterisk here, um, if you cannot use it to cause undefined behavior from safe code. Uh, I will not go into the asterisk now, if we have a bit of time left at the end, uh, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but this distinction is crucial. It doesn't make sense to, uh, to ask if a function like call me here has UB or not, because this is not code you can run. It takes inputs. You need to first supply some inputs. Um, so this is, this is important. Now I want to go over briefly a list of kind of common things people get wrong about undefined behavior. And this is by far the most common one. People test their code, they run their test suite, I don't know, they, they, they write their whole program, they put it on the internet or something, and they say, my code is fine, I tested it, so there can't be any undefined behavior. And we've already seen the example earlier, right, where I changed the comparison a bit so that always return true, still return true, it was still, that program still was wrong. It was just now it happened to be the case that the arbitrary thing the compiler did and it's allowed to do when you violate your contract, was actually the thing you meant it to do. That can happen, and that's almost the worst thing that can happen, because then you think you're safe, but you're not. Anytime you upgrade your compiler, you change your flags, you change anything about the dependencies, this can be arbitrarily unstable, and the behavior might change again. Another common thing you hear in these discussions is people starting to talk about what the hardware does. What the hardware does is utterly irrelevant when we talk about undefined behavior. The, the kind of the rules for what you can and cannot do in Rust are stated on the level of the Rust language. They don't care about hardware concepts. And the link between what the final program produced by the compiler does and what your source program does 
while it might look direct, is actually very, very fragile. The compiler is doing tons of amazing things to make your code go fast. And you probably want that, otherwise you would write assembly. Uh, and you would have to do register allocation by hand and all sorts of other fun things. But because that link is so fragile, the, the very concept of looking what your program does on the hardware only makes sense after we have established that we don't have undefined behavior. You can never argue with hardware things before we first made sure that there even is any kind of connection between your source program and the output. And such a connection only exists if you satisfied your part of the obligation in the contract with the compiler. So what the hardware does is irrelevant. Um, some people also say things like, well, you know, I upgraded my compiler, my code broke, evil compiler. Um, I mean, we tried to avoid this, but when you have undefined behavior in your code, it's totally possible that it worked with one compiler and then stops working later. That's just, that's just in the nature of the beast. Um, some people think undefined behavior is something that compilers or compiler writers spend like days and weeks to find in your program only to backstab you and break your code. That's not how it works. Compiler optimizations are just written under the assumption that there is no undefined behavior. And well, when assumptions get violated, weird nonsense happens. So it's not like compiler authors willingly withhold information from you, knowing your program has UB and not tell you. That's the opposite of what happens. They don't, ha they don't know if your program has UB or not. They just assume it doesn't. And then if it does anyway, weird shit happens. Um, you might think this all sounds terrible. Why, why should we keep up with this? I should just go back to C. Uh, C is all the same game. Uh, there's no difference in undefined behavior between C and Rust. It's all the same problems. Um, and if you use inline assembly to like, maybe, maybe you think you can do out of bounds memory access in inline assembly, there are some things you actually can do, but you have to be super, super careful. It's not a free pass. There are all sorts of assumptions that the compiler, C and Rust alike, makes about how the entire program works. You cannot break those with inline assembly. So with inline assembly, you are almost always just making your life harder. Um, and finally, I disable optimizations so UB can't be a thing that works. Even without optimizations, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Even basic things like register allocation can kind of break when you have undefined behavior. It's true that without optimizations, it's much less likely that undefined behavior affects your program behavior, but it's by far not guaranteed that it doesn't happen. It's still very, very possible. Um, oh yeah, and I also saw that, I think, at some point. It's fine if I put unsafe around it. That's not what unsafe is for. Unsafe doesn't mean undefined behavior is allowed. Unsafe means it's your responsibility to not have undefined behavior. Outside of unsafe, it's the compiler's responsibility or the responsibility of whoever wrote the library that you are using. Inside unsafe, it's your responsibility. Undefined behavior is never okay. It's just not a thing. Um, does anybody want to add any more or have any questions about this? Yes? There's a funny story about the third point where the Clang LDN guys try to make sure that the, the this pointer in methods can never be null and that broke a huge number of projects who relied on that, especially node V8, for example. Yes, yeah. They had to roll it back again. Right, UB can, so, so for, for the people on the stream, this was, there was, a, there was a, a change in Clang to kind of make the compiler exploit that this can never be null. Um, turns out many programs have this be null, including V8, uh, which is kind of important, uh, and so they, they rolled that back. Yes, that's one of the problems with widespread misunderstandings about, misunderstandings about what is and isn't UB. So I said it's all the same mess in C. I would argue the mess is a lot worse in C because in Rust we are, or at least strive to be, and I'm kind of, there's people working on that, very strict and precise about what is and isn't undefined behavior. And also most people don't have to think about it because most people write safe Rust. Whereas in C, it's a lot less clear. Like undefined behavior is everything not mentioned in the standard, which is already kind of a weird way to go about this. Um, a lot of undefined behavior also is mentioned in the standard, also nobody reads the standard, and the people that do don't understand it, um, including myself. So um, I think we are in a better situation in Rust because we are closer to having a very precise understanding to what is and isn't UB. Um, the nature of the problem though is the same. So I hope it's clear now that knowing these rules about what is and isn't UB is absolutely crucial when writing unsafe code. Uh, you shouldn't be writing unsafe code without understanding the part of the rules that applies to the kind of unsafe code you write. You don't always have to know all the unsafe ru rules when you write unsafe code. If you're just calling get unchecked, which says that you have to like, have your index in bounds, that's all you need to know. If you start using raw pointers, you need to lower it. You, you need to lower not more. Know a lot more. If you're using transmute, just don't, I hope. Um, <laughs> but if you do anyway, and sometimes there's good reasons to, you need to know a lot more. Um, 
thankfully, there is a tool that can help you. Um, this tool can't replace knowing the rules, but it can help you like, learn the rules, and it can help you gain confidence that you followed the rules. Uh, this is a tool called Miri that I've been, I didn't start it, it originally was started by a couple other people. Uh, I've been working on it for quite a few years now. Uh, it's called Miri, and it's basically a way to run your code and test it for undefined behavior. So it does the thing which earlier I said doesn't work, like if you just build your, your code with a regular compiler and run it, and then it works, that doesn't tell you anything about undefined behavior. If you run it with Miri, that does tell you something. So specifically, Miri can tell if a given program or a test suite, which is just a program, um, kind of shows undefined behavior during this execution. Miri cannot, and this is important to not remember, Miri cannot tell you whether a library is sound. Because to test if a library is sound, the least you have to test is that it doesn't cause you B for every possible input, and that's a few too many inputs for Miri to try. Maybe it's also very slow, so even, even if it's technically finite, it doesn't work very well. So you still have to have a good test suite to increase confidence in the memory results, and even then you can still be surprised. But it helps a lot. So the, to ensure soundness, we need a theorem prover. This is something which is not decidable. It's not something you can just have a button and it will guarantee to tell you. There are, of course, tools that can help you approximate it and things like that. I mean, OK, so far there aren't such tools, but people are working on them. Undefined behavior, on the other hand, on a concrete program execution with a concrete set of inputs and concrete choices for all the non-determinism is a decidable question which we can answer. But of course, if tomorrow the threat scheduler starts to work a bit differently, then maybe you, undefined behavior is like showing up where it was hidden before or something like that. So um, there's, no, there's no guarantee that all the possible UV was found in alternative execution branches or other inputs of your program, but it helps a lot. One big caveat is that Miri is an interpreter for Rust programs. It executes kind of the Rust source code, or more precisely, one of the Rust IRs, MIR, line by line. So if you call C code, Miri is like, I don't know what to do with it, uh, and just stops. Miri knows a few well-known functions. If you are accessing an environment variable or opening a file, Miri can deal with that. But that list is not very long. If you try to talk to the network, it's already done. Um, but if you're writing pure Rust data structures or things like that, you can get very far in testing with Miri. Miri is also, as I mentioned, very slow. So if you have tests which try like tens of thousands of inputs, you might want to reduce the number of inputs for Miri. Um, but Miri has found tons of bugs in real world code, in the standard library and in crates. Out there, we test the standard library test suite in Miri every day. A whole bunch of crates have Miri on their CI. It's really a thing you can use. It's very easy to install because it comes with Rust up. Um, only on the nightly tool train, so you can just add it as a component. Uh, and then if you're on the nightly tool train, you say cargo Mary test or cargo Mary run, and then it does its magic. Um, so to re-emphasize, one important point is Mary cannot ensure that the library is sound, so it's still worth knowing the rules. So the, 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 the remaining time that I have, I would like to use to go over some of these rules, show a few example programs, and then run them in Miri and show how Miri catches the problem and hopefully answer any questions that come up about the undefined behavior in this program. But before we get there, uh, does anyone want to, like, anyone have any questions about the general framework or things like that? Does not seem. Yes? Yes. So. Uh, yeah, the question about whether there's a list of the rules or whether that's a research question, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, so both sides of the or are true. Um, the, I will, I will uh, well, I can open it now. I was going to go to the list of rules later. There is a page in the Rust reference, behavior considered undefined, which lists the basic rules. Um, and then furthermore, I mean, one of the things it lists is if you, if you call compiler intrinsics, for each intrinsics there's documentation in the intrinsic. Um, like if you call unchecked add, it would say, well, this is UB if the addition overflows. Um, and then every single unsafe function comes with a documentation that says, what do you have to ensure when calling this function? Uh, and and the, impl the implication here is, if you fail to uphold this, it's undefined behavior. Well, for these unsafe functions, uh, that's a conclusive list. It's written in English, so it's not always completely clear what it means when the requirements are a bit less local. I mean, it's very easy for things like get unchecked, where it just says has to be inbounds and then done. Um, but some of these requirements are a bit less local than that. We will see examples. 
Um, and also there's a big warning here at the top of the list, which, which basically is us hedging that we're not done yet writing the spec. This is ongoing research to make the spec complete. Um, I should also uh, mention that MIRI strives to catch all the possible bugs, but there are uh, one or two deficiencies in MIRI where there are things you might do where, which it might not cause the undefined behavior. Those are very, very rare things to happen in code, but they happen. Um, and MIRI tries to be conservative, Evan, as in MIRI will tell you undefined behavior for some things that we tend to allow later, but we don't want to kind of preempt community processes and community consensus on allowing that and kind of making people feel safe uh, about their code just by having MIRI give it a check mark. Um, so uh, that, that might explain some of the differences you might see between MIRI and documentation. Um, yes? I have a question about this example of the 120. Yes? So what the compiler does in terms of optimization isn't really relevant, but relevant is that you broke the rules and which are the rules that you broke. Yeah, I know. So the, the, and the rules in this case is that there's some uninitialized memory here. If you run this in MIRI, we can say that already on this line, before you even start doing anything with the uninitialized memory, MIRI tells you, no, 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 this is not okay. Um, you're returning uninitialized memory here. It's returned at type U8. U8s have to be initialized. Period. So from then onwards, the, the program is already doomed. Um, if you want to understand a bit more precisely why we get this particular outcome, like which series of transformations in the compiler happens to turn this program from doomed by violating the contract into actually doing nonsense, um, what happens internally is that uninitialized memory is represented as a kind of unstable value, which every time you look at it can look different bit like a weird quantum kind of value. I mean, a physicist in the room don't listen, it's not actually anything with quantum, I know that. Um, so it's the, this is a thing that exists in LLVM and conceptually in many of these low-level IRs we use inside compilers. They have v values which are different from every possible bit pattern that you would actually see in a real machine. And every time you look at them, they might look different, which represents the fact that LLVM, if it sees an uninitialized value, doesn't want to waste an entire register on that. So it might actually use different registers each, like each time you look at it, it might use a different register, just oh. picking one at random. So that, that's, that's what could happen. Um, so that's what could happen. That what actually happens here is then LLVM sees, we are asking if an unstable value is less than 120, and LLVM will be like, meh, I guess that's false. Um, <laughs> and then we are asking it if it's equal, and it goes like, yeah, false. Uh, and for greater, it also gets false, but for greater equal, it says true. But that's arbitrary choices. They could have done either way. They're just... Yes. Uh, but it could happen anyway in this stage. Yes. In the future, Rust will get more optimizations before LVM happens. I might already do things here. Um, yeah. Did you have a question? Okay. Yes. Yes. into the mic because uh, otherwise you have to talk like a all the time. Uh, there, there was a question if Miri handles it as an option key or any other enum, but I think you answered that. Right? It's just a magic enum tunnel. I mean, basically every byte in memory is an option U8 is a way to think about it. It's actually, bytes are actually a bit more complicated for pointer reasons I won't get into. Um, but you can think of it as, as every byte in memory is an option U8, if that was the question. So my question is, um, if I understand correctly, the UB actually happens on line 84 and not on the access to the variable, correct? Yes. yes. Because I think in, in languages like C, C++, uh, uh, uninitialized stuff is quite fine as long as you don't actually access it. That's very unclear. Um, it's, so in C++, they have a list 
of things you can do with indeterminate values, which is their name for this. And for example, passing them to a function is not allowed. So the UB would happen certainly the latest, the moment we are passing x to always return true. Um, in C is not entirely clear enough. Um, this will also depend on the type you are using. Like if you're using an int, then there's more optimizations allowed on int than on car. So maybe with car it's okay, but with int it isn't. The problem is that the C spec is a whole pile of English. And the, it's very easy to, in one place of the C spec, say something about, oh, indeterminate values also are a thing, and then forget to update every other place in the C spec where it now should say what happens when you see an indeterminate value, and it just doesn't say anything. Um, what I can tell you is that Clang will add no undef attributes to every single function argument and return value. It might exempt car from that, I'm not entirely sure, but if you, used, if you did this with int, um, then in both C and C++, if you compile it with Clang, there will be undefined behavior, and they think that's justified by the spec. Yes, Chris. We have a stream, just a so. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, this is the first time we do a stream and we don't have this nice pro ball microphone yet. <laughs> 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 and the mic is special. Um, so Clo mouth close to the mic. <laughs> yeah, very close. Okay. Um, give it a moment, I'll get used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so undefined behavior only happens in Rust if you have unsafe code, is that correct? That's a promise that the compiler and language teams make, yes. If there's uh, undefined no. behavior outside of unsafe, that's a bug in the compiler or in the library you're using. So you're saying that um, everything that's unsafe, uh, uh, sorry, everything that's undefined is unsafe. As in like you cannot just have, uh, there's no under specification in the language. In the I mean, there are other kinds of under specification as in non-determinism, for example. You can, you can just like take the address of a local variable and print it to standard out. You don't need to use unsafe code for that. Right, but, uh, but that's not undefined behavior. Correct. Right. So okay. the, 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 there are weaker then. forms of underspecification that can happen in safe code, but there's very strong one. Okay, because then that's really different to when we say that is undefined behavior in C, because in C, undefined behavior, like you said, is any underdefined behavior, basically. Well, no, C also has undefined, unspecified, sure. implementation defined, I don't even know the full list. <laughs> it's sure, just, it's just basically in C, all code is unsafe. I'm saying when you say something is uh, when you say something is undefined, it doesn't automatically mean it's unsafe there. Well, it's see everything is unsafe, so it it doesn't mean that. Uh, you can't <laughs> actually say that. Like you you can say there's no safety guarantee given by the type system. Yeah, or that's by what the unsafe means in Rust. Sure, unsafe but, means but safety is not guaranteed. But you can prove it's safe, right? Like if yes. you, if you prove the absence of you don't have to prove the absence of undefined behavior to prove memory safety, for example. That's what I'm saying. You do. In C, you do, yes. No. Yes. No, you can over-specify. Like, you can... You, you, not everything has to be defined in this... Uh, in, uh, in the C... Um, um, what's it called? Like, um, in the C standard, um, you can... You can you can have, like, deterministic semantics. Like, everyone who's done verification... And, uh, on C has like over-specified things. Oh, if, so if you know your compiler, the compiler might, of course, say that certain things which are UB according to spec have guaranteed behavior. Sure, but you don't even you have to know the that. compiler. You can just assume a more deterministic... Uh, we can take it offline, but basically what I'm saying is undefined behavior according to your definition in Rust and in C do not mean the same thing, it seems to me at least. I so think they mean the same thing. It's, it's just like it's C behaves as if it was an unsafe block everywhere. One is under specification, the other means memory unsafety. No, that's, that's no, what you that's said. not a difference. Let's that's take that offline. Uh, yeah. it, it, means, it means memory unsafety in both of them. <laughs> no, but Rust really, I mean, I don't like the term undefined behavior, but we took it from C because it's what people know. And if you write against, and if you're writing against an arbitrary unknown C compiler, like the only thing you know about your compiler is uh, that it conforms to the spec, uh, so then all the same rules apply. Uh, um, um, okay, let's look at some kinds of undefined behavior and how they look like in Miri. So, I mean, okay, I already briefly showed the underneath thing. Um, the out of bounds axis, that's the, that's the very first program uh, I had in the beginning of the talk. 
Um, and I mean, okay, this is hopefully not too surprising and not too hard. Uh, when you do the read, Miri will tell you, well, there's some allocation, it's size four, you, had F, you are at offset four and reading four more bytes, that just doesn't work. Um, use after free is also easier. I don't think I have to show the code for that. Out of bounds pointer arithmetic might be a bit more surprising. So if you read the documentation of functions like add, offset, or sub on pointers, then the documentation says that even just doing the arithmetic, if it goes out of bounds, is undefined behavior. This is just like pointer arithmetic works in C. Um, and Mary will tell you that. Uh, if, you're, if you're using add the wrong way, then um, you're doing out of bounds pointer arithmetic. Uh, there is another function you can use, which is called wrapping add, which doesn't have those clause. So with wrapping add, this program is now fine. However, just because you can do the arithmetic to go out of bounds doesn't mean you are actually allowed to use that pointer to access memory. Right now it even tells me the unsafe block is unnecessary. If I now do an actual um, read from this pointer, then that's still undefined behavior. It's just that the arithmetic wasn't the problem, it's now the access that's the problem, yes? So my question is, does it uh, check the, the step size? So if you have a struct that's little more than an int, can you, does it check if you add like five instead of eight in the offset? I mean, it precisely checks the bounds of your object. So, so yes. in, a, in a list, in an array, does it notice when I go in the middle of some object instead of an exact offset? That's allowed, so this is not, it's not going to complain about that. Okay, thanks. I mean, there might be other rules you're breaking inadvertently because data might look the wrong way or something, but in principle, um, the in C, pointer arithmetic is limited to array things. In Rust, within an object, you can do pointer arithmetic any way you want. You just have to make sure once you actually do a load that you are in bounds and that the type that you're using for that load is the right one. I will have examples for that later. Um, Insufficient alignment is one that people often get wrong. So um, here's an example. We are creating an array of four U8s and we are casting the pointer into a U32 pointer uh, and using a bunch of methods here instead of the usual casts in Rust because I think the as cast keyword in Rust is one of the worst things to use when using raw pointers. It, it would do way too many things and accidentally break your code. This way we have a bit more type safety. Um, so what, what happens here is we, we have a four byte array, we turn it into a pointer to a single four byte integer. So in terms of bounds, everything is okay. This program still has undefined behavior um, because the array could be sitting at any address. The alignment requirement of such an array is one. So the address has to be divisible by one, which is rather trivial. Whereas integers have an alignment requirement of four on most platforms. So the address of every integer that you load or store or create a reference to has to be divisible by four. And we are violating this here, and that's undefined behavior. Again, the same rule exists in C. Uh, it's just not that widely known. A common argument is that, oh, on x86, there is no alignment things on the hardware, and so I don't have to worry about it. Remember what I said earlier about what the hardware does. It doesn't matter. This is UB on all platforms on C, uh, on, on C and Rust. So, uh, this error right now says it's accessing memory of alignment 2. Is Miri guaranteed to detect this error? Or is this just by chance that this time it's not alignment 4? Very good question. Uh, Miri is not guaranteed to find this error um, because the actual address of this thing is random. Uh, it, in this case, it happens to be divisible by 2, but not 4. That's why this was the error. In general, it could only have been divisible by 1. Um, so this is one of the cases where the non-determinism that occurs when creating a new object creating at a random address, means errors might sometimes be found and sometimes not found. So one of the things that you can do is run Miri many times. It has a flag to change the random seed that's used for all the non-determinism. So you run it with a bunch of different flags, you get higher chances of finding bugs like this. Miri also has a special mode where it will treat alignment in a more symbolic way and is guaranteed to find bugs like this. Unfortunately, it might then also flag errors in code that is actually completely correct. There's, I don't know a way to, to avoid that because there's some code which does really wonky things like imagine the code, um, before, like it, it creates an array without any guarantees and then it tests if the address is aligned and if it is, then goes on. This is, would be fine, but in that other symbolic mode, Miri would complain. And there is code out there which does things like that. Um, one of the things you can do if you're worried about alignment is that there is a read underline function on raw pointers, which does not have the alignment requirement, which on some platforms will be slower 
because on some platforms aligned reads are faster. Um, but if you use read or the normal star, the alignment requirement always applies on all platforms. Uh, and it doesn't just apply when you do a read. Even just creating a reference already incurs a requirement. Or even actually just writing star PTR, no matter what happens afterwards, incurs the requirement. So in this program here, Mary will still complain. Um, yes. Um, yes? Which line is actually now on, say, is it line two, line six? Line seven. Line seven. On line six, we are creating a raw pointer, which is not aligned, and that's OK. Raw pointers, as long as you don't star them, are OK not to be aligned. So this is different than in C. In C, even just creating the pointer would already be undefined behavior. Read unaligned is fine because it's based on raw pointers. And so there's no initial requirement that the pointer itself is already undefined, uh, is already aligned. Uh, but even, even something like this, which some of you might have seen this macro, um, that's UB because we did star the pointer. This might change this particular rule. Uh, I'm in favor of changing it. But for now, we're keeping it UB so that we kind of have the option open of uh, kind of reaching community consensus on some kind of coherent vision. Here. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, does, does Rust, the Rust compiler guarantee uh, deterministic code generation for programs exhibiting undefined behavior? No. No? We don't guarantee anything. Okay. I mean, obviously the execution, like the, the program like, has, like, can produce any kind of value, but like the, the code, gen the assembly at the end, that, that is also non-deterministic? I'm not sure if we guarantee deterministic code gen in any case, even for, even for defined programs. We guarantee that the oh. code gen okay. that you get matches the program you wrote, if yeah. there's no UB. Whether you get the same thing every time, I don't, I mean, certainly it changes with every update. Yeah, so sure, sure. it changes with compiler flags, it changes due to inline right, right, all right. sorts I mean, of things. Uh, like for so a given compiler version. I, I, I think we want it to be deterministic, but you know, sometimes things happen where hashing is based on pointers and pointers change because of uh, address layout randomization and then the iteration order in a hash table differs and then suddenly the compiler gives you a slightly different output. I can answer that. So <laughs> so the quick and dirty answer to that question is the standard Rust compiler, no, but there is a certified version that's uh, engineered by Ferris, uh, the Rust people in Berlin. In Ferrisin, you mean? Yeah, Ferrisin, yeah, from uh, Florian Ginke and uh, what's the other one, uh, Ada, right? So they have a certified compiler that is generating the same output, but that's not available currently. All right, thanks. Another point to consider here is that Rust has compile time code evaluation, and it supports unsafe code in its compile ah, time okay. code evaluation, sure. yeah, so you yeah. can actually cause okay. undefined behavior at compile time. That's yeah, good, good point. Just think about this for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to do a quickly over some of those. So invalid values are bad. Rust cares a lot about its types. Now we're getting into some kind of things which are UB in Rust, but not like that in C. I'm not actually sure about bool. Uh, it's a bit unclear. I think in Buddhist might, in, in, for Buddhist might be UB and C as well, but in general, C is less strict about its type. So turning two into a Boolean is undefined behavior, even if you never look at that Boolean. Just creating the bool is undefined behavior. This is important because there are optimizations which might introduce code looking at the Boolean, even if you didn't write any such code. So we want to have that requirement always. Such optimizations occur very naturally. For example, imagine we had some kind of loop um, and then in that loop, we did an if x. And then the compiler realizes that this entire loop is um, this entire thing, if x, doesn't actually depend on the loop variable and wants to move the if x out of the loop. But the compiler doesn't actually know if the loop would ever run. Like the loop goes from 0 to i, maybe i is 0. So if only looking at a, if, if, if a bad bool would only be ub once you look at it, then moving an if out of a loop would not be a valid optimization anymore because maybe the if was never executed, so the if was dead code, and we made it live code by moving it out. So that's, that's why we have some of these rules where just creating bad data is UB even if you never look at it, so that we can do things like move uh, loop invariant code out of a loop. Um, and there are more invalid values. What do we have here? Um, characters, there's a requirement that car is a valid Unicode code point, so don't violate that. Um, 
One of the lesser known ones is function pointers are non-null. So if you're interfacing with C code and you're representing a C function pointer, always use option of fin and Rust. Option of fin can be nulled, but just fin cannot be nulled. Uh, there is a guarantee that option fin will match the layout of a pointer in C. Um, Maybe can find data races. That's something I'm very happy about because I didn't implement any part of this. People just showed up, open source is amazing, and started implementing more and more ingredients for Rust to for Miri to suddenly support all sorts of concurrency, um, which is not what I expected. Uh, but now Miri is very good at finding concurrency bugs and has found a couple of bugs in the wild, um, including data races and also weird behavior incurred by weak memory models, which is something you might have heard of and then you should be scared of it. Um, Matthias tells me that between lines 11 and 8, there is, a, there is a data race because we're doing two write accesses which are insufficiently synchronized. Um, and last but not least, I'm not even going to show the examples here, there are rules about references. Shared references are immutable and mutable references are unique. Uh, those rules are the most complicated undefined behavior rules we have. They are also very important and very like, unstable um, in the sense of we, haven't, we don't have a, a consensus yet for what they should look like. Um, but they are important because they let us do very strong optimizations on references, even if we don't know where, where they come from, and we interact with other code we can't analyze. So they're super powerful, way beyond what any other programming language really can do. Uh, but they are also rather careful. And the short summary is, if you, like, if you only use raw pointers, you are fine. If you only use references, you are fine. Don't mix references and raw pointers, then things become, tr become tricky. Uh, I'm curious about the data race detector. Yes. You said the uh, mirror is an interpreter, so does that mean the detection is also, uh, well, uh, undeterministic here? Or uh, it is, is not quite as much as you might think. So the detection is based on vector clocks, uh, which means we don't have to have these operations actually execute adjacently. It, it works pretty much exactly like, what is the Valgrind based detector called again? Helgrind? No. There are two data rate detectors for Valgrind. I forgot what they're called. Um, they use basically the same thing. Um, where you detect that an access happened and then later another access happened and there wasn't synchronization. There is still some amount of non-determinism inherent always when you have concurrency, where in some executions there might have happened to be synchronizations for other edges or I don't know, something like that. But it's actually much more deterministic than you might think, basically, in, your ability, in its ability to find these races. Um, the more non-deterministic thing is that if you use um, atomics directly and you have this weak memory scary thing going on, then the, something that can happen according to the spec is that you read outdated values um, when you do a load. There's multiple possible like, things you could load at any moment. This rarely happens on real hardware, but it does happen. Uh, and Miri will just uniformly at random pick one of the values. Uh, and so there you might have to run your program a couple of times to make sure they are all covered. Miri also emulates the weak compare and swap in the standard library, which is a compare and swap that might fail to tell you when it did successfully a thing. That's the um, Yes, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. So uh, for a more complete list, as, as the, I already mentioned earlier when the question came up, you can check the reference. Every unsafe library function must document their requirements. If you find a crate with an unsafe function that doesn't document it, the crate author did it wrong. Um, and so with that, remember when writing unsafe Rust, always follow the rules. Uh, and uh, if possible, use Mary to help you do that. Thank God. Thanks all. So, more questions? I think we'll do five more minutes and then we'll take a quick break. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know where the toilets are, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you mentioned that Miri stops when it encounters C code. Uh, my question is whether it stops completely or just for the C part and continues with like Rust. So I could imagine that like uh, C returns to some pointer, so obviously it cannot reason about this pointer. But maybe later in code there are like pure Rust pointers that it can know something about. So no, it just stops completely. Completely. I mean, like we, we can't know what the C function will do. We can't know which value it will return. We're just completely lost at this point. Maybe it doesn't have support for symbolic execution or reasoning about unknown values. Um, so no, it just stops. There's not really much of an alternative here. There is some work in progress thing on doing some crazy lib FFI shenanigans to call the real C code without UB detection, obviously, to get its behavior and kind of what hasn't been implemented yet 
actually reflect this on the mirror memory, which should actually be possible, though that's kind of crazy. Um, and then this will serious, serious, uh, severely impact the ability to find UB also on the memory side, but could go well with hand in hand with some of the existing um, uh, things in memory. So one thing I should mention is if you use pointer integer casts, or rather integer two pointer casts, A, don't. B, um, memory will warn you because once you start doing that, it won't be able to find all bugs anymore. The spec for those things is kind of not quite there yet. The spec we have is not something you can actually run. It's only something you can prove. And um, so memory will warn you about that. Uh, and, and in C, it would just be a lot more of that kind of memory possibly missing bugs around really weird pointer shenanigans. But it maybe does support everything else in Rust. Like you can do, like I don't know, crazy dun table, whatever, something unsafe pointer transmutes. Everything should work. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, one question. So in like microcontrollers and embedded systems, why is there always an embedded guy in the crowd? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the embedded guy. I'm just curious. So you, you have these things like I don't know, uh, input output things where you just have to write to a specific address to make something happen. And then you have these libraries that like abstract that for you, but in the end they just pick a random address from a spec and write or read from it and have some like volatile markers around this. And you said hardware doesn't matter, but like how do these things go together? Is this all undefined behavior and it just works because we believe in it or? <laughs> like that would be bad, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, so first of all, like Miri doesn't work in that case. Obviously, Miri has no clue that you have an MMO register at address 42. Um, on the Rust side, uh, no, this is not undefined behavior. The, the, the full way of making this formal is complicated, but basically we don't assume that Rust knows all the memory that exists. Rust controls some amount of memory. If you create a local variable somewhere, this is assumed to be completely Rust controlled memory. But we are kind of working in an open world situation where there might be other memory that exists from the beginning of the program, kind of in the initial state, at addresses which Rust doesn't know about. Um, and it is the responsibility of the surrounding runtime or whoever else is part of setting that all up that this memory never overlaps with any memory Rust understands and knows about. But assuming that is the case, it is completely okay to access that memory from Rust. You have to still follow the Rust rules, as in if you create a reference to that memory, all the aliasing things still apply and stuff like that. Um, but it is okay to access memory like that. So yep. in that case, yeah, there's a big asterisk according to what the hardware does. This, this refers to arguments of the form of x86 doesn't have alignment requirements, therefore it's okay to deref unaligned pointers in C when you compile only to x86. No. They were like, I think it was RAND, like some really, really big Rust crates which had a CF, like if CFG bang to be like, oh, on, on x86 we just do the unaligned accesses, El everywhere else we, we are careful. This is just not okay. It's always UB on all platforms. But if you have very specific environment kind of things, that's less about my, assembly, my, my CPU doesn't have data races or something, that's more about there's extra things in my environment that are outside of the control of Rust that I want to interact with. Uh, and then that's fine. That environment will probably set up extra rules. You might have to use volatile. There's all sorts of things that apply there, but it's in principle possible. Similar things happen when you start using inline assembly, for example. We still do the last two questions. Have you had one and you had one, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, you said that uh, Miri doesn't ha have any support for sort of symbolic calculations. I was wondering, coming back to this FFI, if, there, if it would be possible to uh, sort of specify the behavior of uh, a foreign function um, and then have Miri like sort of bypass the foreign function based on those assumptions, even uh, though it's not possible now. Like, is there anything in Miri I that mean, stops that from... I mean, of course, you could happening. rewrite Miri from scratch with support for symbolic values everywhere. That would be a lot of work because Miri reuses a lot of compiler infrastructure. The thing we do is that for well-known functions, like, I don't know, when you want to access an environment variable um, or print the standard out, Miri is like, oh, I know this C function. It's called, like, get env. Um, I will actually implement that. So we, we have, in, in, we call them shims. We have a whole lot of these shims inside Miri which will then behave as if you did get env. So you do set env and you do get env, you actually see the value change. This is completely separate from the actual process environment, but we also have a flag which allows them to, to be synced. Um, so like for specific functions, we can add support that way. Obviously, we can only do this for like 
big popular functions that have reasonable small functionality. If you link your C code with the Python interpreter and call that, we will not embed the Python interpreter in MIRI just to implement that shit. Yes, it's, it's a mir e, the mir interpreter, though we don't spell it like that. Right. Um, it, it works on this IR level uh, called mir in the compiler. Um, it's really basically just another front end for the compiler. Like it's, it, it, it actually, well, back end, I don't know, code end. It, it reuses all of the compiler infrastructure, but then instead of generating code, it, um, it just interprets it line by line. Okay, so you can't, like, uh can't you just call a different interpreter for C at the points when C functions are called? Uh, if you give me an interpreter for C that yeah. actually yeah, matches yeah, exactly. all of the undefined behavior Exa and all of that? No, no, no. I'm saying, like, uh, <laughs> can you say, given, an inter uh, given a function that would interpret the C, uh, I just call it at the points when there are FFI calls? You could, but uh, this becomes hard once that memory is shared between C and Rust, because then the C interpreter might have to access the memory memory, and memory memory isn't just an area of bytes because in the Rust spec, yeah. memory okay. isn't so just so an area of bytes. So you need the whole FFI so compatibility. Right, so you would have, these interpreters would have to be tightly integrated. Right. Uh, I think there is currently someone working, so there exists an interpreter for LVMIR. It doesn't actually describe all LVMIR UB the way Mary does, um, but there is someone currently trying to wire that up with Mary, as I found out when they reported that they get weird linking errors when they try doing that. Um, <laughs> So if you compile your C code with Clang to LVMIR, that something like that might work. Um, but yeah, still very much work in progress. So quick follow-up, is it plugin friendly? No. Ah, so no plugins. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have a stable API. We don't, like, we don't have a stable anything. <laughs> uh, the Rust compiler isn't plugin friendly already. Uh, we really want to have the freedom to, to like, rebuild and re-architect the internals. It's like the Linux kernel, right? There's no out-of-tree modules, which is not a thing. I guess a, a bit open question, but let me give it a try. So there is a bunch of code that it's aimed to be compiled and to run uh, as, for example, WebAssembly. But the way people test this code is they just write unit tests to like, you know, cargo test, and then it's compiled on their actual architecture they work on, like x86 or ARM or whatever. And then it, keeps me in this place of discomfort that developers test the code all the time on different architecture they aim to deploy it. And I wonder if maybe here you have some advice that may be MIRI or maybe not MIRI related, how, what can go wrong, what to look after, what to do to protect against some things going nuts in such situations. I mean, Rust is in general f fairly portable. So like if you don't have UB, um, and if you don't have CFG target arch or target whatever uh, uh, in your code, then it should behave the same um, on x86 and, uh, and WebAssembly. Some of the non-determinism might be different, like if you look at the addresses of the stack or interleavings of threads or something, those are different, but that's a problem even like between an x86 Linux and Windows or even two Linuxes or whatever. Um, so. But like most of Rust is actually very portable. Um, but it depends a lot on the details. I should also mention one other thing Mary is quite useful for. If you're doing low level coding, one of the things that you might run into at some point is this funny thing called endianness, where some targets represent integers different from, different from other targets. Because Mary is an interpreter, it can cross interpret. So you can be on your Linux 64 bit little endian system and you just say dash dash target MIPS something something like the correct target triple which might be a 32-bit big endian system, and maybe we'll run your code as if it were on that target. You can be on a Windows host and run it as if it were Linux. All these, like, in principle, any possible combination there is possible there in terms of maybe just testing your code um, and making sure, like, for, so, so like the bytes crate, I think, for example, uses memory to ensure that it will also work on big endian targets. Thank you. In this I case, the break. A it's break. now break. <laughs> After the break, we will have uh, Guillaume's uh, talk. And when do we meet again? Uh, 20? Yeah, let's meet. Let, let's let's meet in eight minutes back here.